Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Mark <coughs> Hanuel. I'm director of the Institute for the Humanities. And I am charged with um, beginning um, this afternoon's program. Um, and I would like to thank Lina Brito of Northwestern University and Joaquin Chavez of UIC for organizing this wonderful event today. Um, and I'd like to welcome all of you to UIC, um, especially our speakers today. And you'll be hearing more about them in just a moment, but they are Alejandro Velasco, Veronica, Veronica Zubiaga, and David Smilda. And I want uh, extend a particularly warm welcome to all of them um, uh, on our campus and in Chicago. And I'm really honored to be starting things off here um, and honored that the organizers asked me to speak because I had so little hand in actually <laughs> dreaming up and organizing this event. I can take just no credit in planning it. It was their ingenuity, it was their intellectual energy and hard work that made all of this possible. Um, and so aside from extending my sincere thanks to them, I'll also thank the various departments and units at the, at the University of Chicago and Northwestern University who contributed to this event. Um, and I should also add that the work that the Imagining Peace in the 21st Century Working Group at the UIC Institute for the Humanities, co-organized co by Joaquin Chavez and Andreas Feldman, is um, a particularly compelling model for how vital and interesting work in the humanities can devise programming that engages with audiences within and outside the university. And so I'm so grateful for the fact that that uh, working group exists. Our intellectual communities work the best, I think, um, when we are com in communication with faculty and students and also with the community at large um, in order to think up programs that are meaningful for all of us. And as director of the institute here at UIC, I do invite all of you, faculty and students and those of you who aren't at UIC, to communicate with us directly at the institute when you think that there is something interesting that you would like to see and do. We want to hear about it. Um, mcanuel at uic.edu, please um, feel free to let me know, know directly. Um, and so, um, uh, when there are matters of urgent interest that seem to require a conference, a speaker, or some kind of focused discussion that requires that extra infusion of resources, or sometimes just to hold a space for an event, we have that space at the Institute. Um, and our resources, like everywhere at UIC, aren't lavish. Um, but when we pair up with generous partners, as we're doing today, um, and when we find engaged audiences, like we have here today, um, we, um, it's exactly the kind of thing that we want to support for the intellectual life of our campus and indeed for the city. So I will um, just say very briefly how grateful I am to have this particular group of interlocutors here today um, uh, to talk about the crisis in Venezuela a problem that we're reminded of constantly in terms of rising poverty, a food crisis, infant mortality, and other threats to uh, health and well-being. And so I look forward to a discussion that I think we'll find informative and necessary. So thank you all um, for joining uh, us. And I will hand things over to Lena to take things over from me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so first of all, thanks a lot to the Institute for the Humanities and to its director, Man, uh, Mark Canuel, and to the associate director, Linda Vabra, that you can see just right there. She was our uh, guardian angel, and without all the work and professionalism uh, uh, that she put on this event, uh, this wouldn't be happening. So thanks so much to both of you. Uh, I also like to thank uh, my dear friends and colleagues, Joaquin Chavez and Andreas Feldman. So Joaquin is professor here in the Department of History and Andreas is a professor in the Department of Political Science. Um, and their friendship and intellectual curiosity were all behind this event. So actually the event started uh, as an informal conversation between Joaquin and myself. Uh, we were talking about what was happening in Venezuela. I'm Colombian. 
Joaquin is Salvadorian, uh, and our concern for the situation was more than just academic and intellectual. It was absolutely personal, uh, as Latin Americans we are, um, and, and committed intellectuals with what's happening in the region. So we started, you know, like brainstorming about, okay, what can we do uh, about this, right, in our very uh, limited capacities. And we came up with the idea of like um, having this event where we have like uh, three different perspectives um, on the crisis and open to the general public and to the media as well. Uh, and finally, this is what's happening. So thanks so much to Joaquin and then to Andreas who join us uh, later on in brainstorming and like uh, making uh, this possible and as rich as possible. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the Department of History at Northwestern University where I worked uh, because they were very generous and they never doubt uh, about the importance of this uh, topic and the importance of the event. Uh, and thanks to their uh, economic support, um, we are uh, also here. And um, to the Latin American and Caribbean Studies program at Northwestern University and the Buffett Center for Global Studies and the Chabraya Center for Historical Studies, all those programs at Northwestern who are also contributing and co-sponsoring this event. Um, and the third kind of leg of this uh, uh, event is the University of Chicago, the Center for uh, Latin American Studies at the University of Chicago and the Department of History also joined uh, in co-sponsoring and making this possible. So thanks to them and to the director, Brody Fisher, and the associate director, Natalie Arsenal, uh, that they work really hard for this to happen. And finally, uh, to all the people that are part of the staff and the graduate students that are collaborating and working hard in all those hundreds of details uh, for this to run smoothly. So thanks to them a lot. And finally, last but not least, to all of you for your interest, for your presence, and for your curiosity. And now I introduce my friend Joaquin Chavez, who's going to tell you a little bit more about the Imagining Peace in the 20th Century, which is the general um, initiative in which this event uh, fits. Thank you. Uh, greetings and welcome, everyone. Uh, it's really a great pleasure for me and an honor to be here at uh, this event. <clears throat> First, I'd like to express my gratitude to professors Alejandro Velasco, Veronica Subillaga, and David Smiley for participating in this event and taking the time to travel from very distant places to, to this city to be here with us today. And also to all the institutions and people who have made this event possible. Um, basically, I'd like to outline briefly the, the objective of this event as we have uh, initially discussed it with Linda, Andreas, and other organizers. Uh, the objective of this event, uh, organized by the University of Illinois at Chicago, UIC, Northwestern University, and the University of Chicago, is to promote an academic dialogue on a crucial topic for the future of democracy and peace in Latin America, namely the current crisis in Venezuela. This is an intellectual effort to clarify substantive issues on the origins characteristics, and potential outcomes of such crises. Our intention is to promote an academic reflection on the crisis in Venezuela as a public service for communities in Chicago, the United States, and other countries who might be interested in this topic. I would like to kindly invite all of you to participate in this discussion. This event is organized as follows. First, our guest speakers will offer introductory remarks. Second, Professor Lina Brito and I will ask a few questions to the presenters. And third, the public will have the opportunity to ask succinct questions to the presenters using uh, index cards. We chose this method of um, participation to allow as many people as possible to post questions to our guest speakers. Um, and depending on how much time is left, perhaps we will be able to open up the, the mic 
Uh, lastly, I would, like, I would like to invite all of you to join future events organized by the Imagining Peace in the 21st Century Working Group at UIC, which is a, a study group organized uh, by Professor Andreas Felmas and I, other colleagues and students that specializes in, in the study of peace processes in many different regional settings. So basically this event is part of this larger effort to, to study such processes. So thank you very much everyone for being here and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. So the presentations um, that constitute the first part of the event um, it's going to start with Alejandro Velasco. So Alejandro Velasco is Associate Professor of History in Gallant School at New York University. Uh, he works on urban history and popular participation and mobilization in Venezuela, and he's also the executive editor of NACLA, uh, the North American uh, Congress for Latin America. Uh, which produces um, a very uh, important magazine and journal on Latin American affairs. Um, and it's actually celebrating his, its 50th ber birthday, right? This year or last year? This year. This year. So um, Alejandro Velasco's book, uh, Barrio, Barrio Rising, Urban Popular Politics and the Making of Modern Venezuela was published in the year 2015 and made a very uh, huge impact in the field on urban history and politics, won the Laza uh, Fernando Coronil Book Award. Um, and today he's going to offer a historical perspective on Chavismo and the Bolivarian movement and that's going to help us to contextualize this crisis uh, in its historical uh, roots. So please um, join me in welcoming Alejandro Velasco. Well, thank you so much, Lena, for the introduction and all of you for um, coming and, of course, the wide list of um, sponsors for the event. Um, yeah, so I have the task of offering some contextual remarks that hopefully will um, anchor our conversation about the present in uh, a little bit of a deeper history. Um, and I guess I want to start by um, offering, as we will hear, I think, from Veronica and David to some extent as well, Veronica's coming from Caracas, um, just the, the, the depth of the crisis is, um, is something that, um, that is hard to capture, um, not only in figures, but also hard to capture narratively. So for those of us who you know, have family in Venezuela and who um, work on Venezuela, um, trying to do the work of, of being able to relay some of um, that depth is, is problematic for a number of reasons. But I think partly it's because um, what seeing what Venezuela is going through right now tends to elicit is, is basically two kinds of reactions. Um, the first one is um, is shock, uh, just a sense of you know how is this happening in the country that has um, the world's largest oil proven oil reserves in the world? Um, why is this happening in a country that um, not long ago, I'm talking about 10 years ago, in many of the United Nations um, and other kinds of um, in, you know, global institutional um, markers was, was achieving some tremendous progress in alleviating poverty and in increasing caloric intake and in, uh, expanding the uh, access to education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the, not only that, but the, the fact that, that this crisis has seemed to happen so rapidly um, uh, seems to have caught uh, most people off guard. Um, and so first is sort of this kind of reaction of shock and, and then uh, how, to, how to think about um, uh, shock. The second reaction is, is sort of the opposite. It's sort of deja vu. Like we've seen this before. Um, and uh, with, with some uh, caveats, which, which I'll mention. But basically the idea here being that in fact Venezuela with differences in terms of scale, depth of crisis, has actually seen this dynamic before. Um, and partly the reason why this explanation, um, or at least this reaction, tends to have some traction is because 
of the larger understanding of Venezuela as uh, what uh, Fernando Coronil, who, yes, uh, uh, thank you for mentioning the award, <laughs> um, uh, who wrote a very famous book called The Magical State in the late 90s, at a moment of deep crisis in Venezuela, diagnoses, and, and others like Terry Carl, um, uh, political scientist who studies Venezuela, had diagnosed as a kind of paradox of plenty or a magical state. Um, the idea that um, even though Venezuela was endowed and to some extent you know, blessed, although the opposite of the blessing would be a curse um, with tremendous oil riches, it tended to go through these cycles of enormous wealth and anticipation and expectation only to see those, um, uh, those ideas collapse suddenly, dramatically, and sometimes violently. Um, and so you know, we think about um, some of these cycles of boom and bust, on one hand, it can be easily correlated to what are um, the uh, oil, the booms and busts in oil prices worldwide, and to some extent we can sort of see that. Um, certainly we saw that in the case of the 1970s, uh, when a huge spike in oil prices, um, at a time when Venezuela had begun to position itself as, as quite anomalous in Latin America as one of the small islands where uh, a semblance of representative democracy was taking root at a moment when elsewhere in the region you had you know, dictatorships and civil wars breaking out all over. And Venezuela seemed to be, on the other hand, a kind of an island of, of stability, hard-fought stability, um, coming from a period in the 1960s of, of guerrilla warfare that eventually coalesced into what became, uh, came to be known as a two-party uh, two -party system, a uh, uh, democracia pacta, a pacted democracy where two major parties traded power and, um, uh, in, in a shared vision about um, progress in Venezuela. And in that context of the 1970s, when you have an oil boom as a result of the oil embargo of the 1970s, you see that dynamic expanded on one hand, but also begin to hear uh, really substantive critiques as to what this uh, uh, revenue windfall might actually do, not positively but negatively for the country. And the reasons were both uh, economic and political, and I want to just highlight those because then it's going to link up to explaining what's, uh, I think, help us to explain what's happening now. The economic ones are pretty straightforward to understand, meaning you know, when you have this tremendous oil uh, revenue windfall, the idea is that you can do anything. You have limited wealth to be able to, um, to modernize, to be able to invest, et cetera, et cetera. But um, as we found, in, uh, the other side of that dynamic is that uh, people, you know, Venezuela politicians didn't just spend what they had, they spent what they anticipated having, right? So you had this sort of paradox where uh, not only uh, were uh, revenues going up, but also debt was rising significantly simultaneously. Um, and you know, at, not unlike what we're seeing now, uh, people are only too pleased. People, institutions, um, uh, you know, sovereign <coughs> debt holders, etc., were only too pleased to extend these um, uh, this debt because of the assumption that not only were we going to be paid back, but with high interest rates to boot, right? And so it was very easy in the certain the global circulation of petrodollars at the time for Venezuela both to spend lavishly and also to go deep into debt, which collapsed as the idea of that collapsed as uh, oil prices collapsed in the beginning of the 1980s. So Venezuela was left not only holding the bag of these enormous projects that it had contracted, but also of a tremendous amount of debt that it could no longer um, uh, 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 pay uh, in terms of its, its regular revenues. And so what that occasioned over time in the 1980s was a similar kind of Again, with caveats, because uh, I don't want to make a comparison between the, the depth of the crisis now and what was happening in the 1980s, but in terms of the larger dynamic, it's, um, it's similar. Um, uh, where we had seen tremendous social gains in the 1970s, many of those gains in terms of poverty, in terms of extreme poverty, in terms of access to health, education, um, services, infrastructure collapse, et cetera, those uh, indicators began to dr uh, drop dramatically in the 1980s. And they come to a head um, in 1989 when there was a tremendous social explosion after there was an attempt to implement a series of neoliberal reforms to basically get the economy under control and what came to be known as the Caracasa, which um, ended up in hundreds uh, of deaths at the hand of the of the state, which had basically just come to its uh, come to realize that there was a crisis um, that that not a crisis of of, of economics, really, and this is the other part, a crisis of politics, meaning a crisis of representation. 
that was the other part of the, the sort of the petro state dynamic of Venezuela. As the state ballooned in the 1970s, so did the distance between those that it represented and those who led it in terms of the political parties, um, the two of the Purex and Democratica and Cope. Um, and so as those parties uh, it grew more and more distant, especially with popular sectors that were bearing the brunt of the crisis in the 1980s. Uh, eventually, as a result of these reforms that were implemented, what you had was a social explosion, which I'm going to end with in terms of why this idea of a social explosion um, is both so highly referenced in trying to understand the current crisis and also so problematic in trying to think about potential solutions. Um, Anyway, all this is to suggest that this cycle of boom and bust is not new. What you found in the 1990s uh, as a result of this crisis of representation as well as the economic crisis that was uh, facing Venezuela was the rise of, a, uh, of an outsider, right, of a, of, of a new leader that could um, somehow bring together the, uh, the, um, the unmet uh, expectations of this vast swath of the people who not only had lost their um, hopes of, uh, of a modern Venezuela, but also felt completely disenfranchised and unrepresented by the parties in power. And of course, this is where Chavez comes from, um, as, a, as not only an outsider, but a very particular outsider from the military, um, to, uh, you know, with a discourse about uh, uh, fighting the corruption of the, of the two parties in power, and also, more significantly, a discourse about a different kind of democracy, a participatory democracy, that would uh, much more directly channel the expectations and uh, participation of the population into the decision-making process, rather than sort of this delegative, um, representative democracy that had characterized the two-party period. Um, this is significant to understand because I think it helps us to contextualize a different history uh, beyond the boom and bust cycle history that I've been mentioning, and that is the history of Chavismo itself. Right, and so even though the, if you can think about sort of the meta dynamic of processes of uh, political and economic processes that afflict Venezuela as a very particular kind of petro state, such as I described, Chavismo itself itself has a very particular history within that meta history, and what I'd like to. Uh, uh, suggest here is that there, there's basically two major moments um, in, in, the, uh, in the history of Chavismo itself, again, beyond this, um, this meta-narrative that I was just describing. The first moment begins around 1999 with, uh, with Chavez's um, uh, his election in 1998 and then his actual um, you know, taking of power in 1999, and lasts right around 2003-2004. Um, and this is the period before a tremendous spike in oil prices in the wake of the invasion of Iraq, right, and what that's going to unleash in terms of global oil prices. The reason why this period becomes so significant to segment off, at least for me, to segment off from what happens afterwards, is that this period, again to my mind, uh, lays the foundations for an intractable polarization that uh, whose effects we are seeing right now in shaping the uh, possibilities for any kind of negotiated um, outcome that, for, to the crisis that we're seeing. Uh, in the following way, what you found in this period, even though we like to think of Chavez um, as this you know, tremendous firebrand, socialist, uh, you know, radical, the fact is that Chavez doesn't mention socialism until 2005, right? He doesn't talk about sort of a broad-based socialist program until 2005. And he does so in large part because of this access to this tremendous wet revenue windfall coming now from the boom in oil prices. What you found before that were a series of pretty piecemeal, although I suspect this might be controversial to some, but pretty piecemeal reforms of the political system that, again, primarily were rooted in the idea of expanding the range of what we understand uh, of democracy, not so much rooted in uh, sort of institutional representation, but more participatory, plebiscitary styles of politics, right? So you have constant elections where people are being referended in, in, about their opinions. And these kinds of and also, uh, you know, very strategically, uh, reform of the, the oil sector, which um, at the time was uh, largely uh, privatized, right? Uh, de facto privatized, even if not necessarily de jure privatized. So the idea is like we, we need to harness, even though oil was at the time very, very low in prices, we need to high, you know, harness those, um, you know, the oil industry to be able to redistribute the revenues of oil into um, social, uh, social programs. And again, so these 
largely piecemeal, not really radical reforms at the time were met with enormous um, insurrectionary uh, opposition, right? And I, again, we can get into what I mean by this, but if, you know, talking about coups in 2002 and oil industry lockout at the end of 2002, 2003, I mentioned this not to uh, shield or to uh, absolve from blame of Chavismo and what happens later, but rather to suggest that that moment of polarization, that even mild reforms to the political system and a social system um, were met with that level of opposition fixed, especially in the minds of popular sectors who had come to see themselves identified not with, again, sort of a policy panorama of Chavez, but the idea of greater participation fixed in their minds that there is very little here to find in terms of negotiating with an old elite, political and economic, right? Um, this, I think, in large part explains the tremendous trust gap that we find among, you know, in terms of social classes in Venezuela, which is reflected not only in polls, right, but it's also reflected in the uh, large inability, not inability, but, the, but what we find is um, even in moments when opposition, the opposition wins, it wins not with a, with a kind of numbers that one would expect given the, the, the depth of the crisis, but rather um, either you know, people uh, don't vote for Chavismo who had voted before for Chavismo or um, uh, uh, or they vote for the opposition, but in smaller numbers. I'm talking about here about popular sectors in particular. So this trust gap um, has its origins in this moment where even you know, piecemeal reforms in the context of a you know, before a moment of renewed oil revenue windfalls uh, was already situating um, a, a dynamic that was going to be irresolvable later. This ends in about this period, um, and here I'll stop, in about 2005, 2004, 2005, as I mentioned with number one, on the economic side, the tremendous boom in oil prices that, we, that are gonna see oil prices go from basically $8 a barrel in 1998 to an average of 100, not an average, a high of $130 in 2010, right? So you can imagine just really the scope of that and what that's going to do for the idea that now we now we can have an, our opportunity again to transform Venezuela, but basically what that did in the heart of Chavismo was completely allied, not completely, but uh, significantly allied the discourse of participant, not just not the discourse, but the practice of a participatory political strategy, and basically sub, um, subsume that participatory strategy to a much more delegative, um, state-centered, and uh, personalistic rule on the part of, of Chavez. So all this is to say that the period between um, 1999 and 2005, <coughs> for the reasons that I mentioned, fixed a dynamic of polarization that we are seeing right now as an obstacle to any kind of negotiation between social classes in Venezuela, which had been long stemming. But secondly, that crisis of, uh, that's also suggested in the crisis of representation within Chavismo among people who imagined a, a prior era where participation was the real benchmark of what was new and novel and exciting about uh, Chavismo. And that has been lost completely over time, um, you know, uh, eroded as the goal of now those in power in Venezuela is only to stay in power rather than to uh, enact any kind of, um, uh, of larger vision of, of participatory politics, right? Um, so that's that. So next. Oh. So now let's welcome Veronica Subillaga. Um, she's associate professor in the Department of Behavioral Science and Technologies at the Universidad Simón Bolívar in Caracas, and she's coming from Caracas. Uh, she's a renowned sociologist and anthropologist who specializes on gender, urban violence, and drug trafficking in Venezuela. And she has been a visitor professor at Brown University and at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard University. And what she has done in the, in the last um, many years uh, has been very interesting because she bridged uh, her academic work with like, social and media work uh, and she became a very important voice uh, in the mass media and social media in Venezuela, contributing to understand what was happening, especially the inner dynamics of the crisis and the conflict itself. Um, 
so she has written extensively in Spanish and published in Spanish and uh, is one of those leading uh, scholars uh, defining the field of social violence in Latin America more generally. So today uh, her contribution is to talk precisely about that, about the inner dynamics and the escalation of the conflict and the inner dynamics of the crisis. So let's welcome Veronica. So thank you so much, Lina, Joaquin, Andreas, for inviting me to be here. I'm very happy to share with you, coming from Venezuela, what is happening in my country. So the title of my presentation is The Crisis of Citizen Security in Bolivarian Venezuela, and it's based in an ethnographic research I'm working on right now with other colleagues such as Andres Antillano, Keimer Avila, and Chelina Sepulveda, and it's supported by the Open Society Foundations. So um, I wanted to start highlighting that on March 31st, when the Chief Prosecutor um, Luisa Ortega denounced that we were living a breakdown of the constitutional order that in fact led to the four months of massive protests, that day she also denounced that in 2016, we had at least 21,000 people that were murdered in Venezuela. And also, she said that at least 4,000 of them were killed <coughs> by the security forces. That means that the state is responsible for 21% of the violent killings in my country. So, also according to the re to recent declarations of the Minister of Justice in Venezuela, Right now, Venezuela would have the highest homicide rate in the world, even higher than uh, El Salvador. So the point I want to focus here is precisely the crisis of citizen security in Venezuela, and um, I invite you to focus on the state. So um, in the frame of a traditional and historic militarization of citizen security in Venezuela, and amid this current um, deepening of the economic crisis caused by the collapse of oil prices, where we are experiencing hyperinflation, food shortage. So uh, what I argue is that we are moving from a carceral and punitive phase to a systematic state killing. Uh, that means that nowadays the state is deploying extra legal violence to enforce its political domination and to guarantee uh, territorial sovereignty in the popular sectors. And that is the, the point I want to highlight here. So when I speak about militarization, I understand it as the legitimation of the use of force. And, and it's a warlike mentality. So everything is defined in terms of war, in terms of enemies, in terms of, um, of, um, of, a, com of a belly conflict. So here you can see the list of uh, ministers of interior and justice that we have had from 1999 up to the present. So what I wanted to show is that we have had 15 ministers, ministers of interior and justice, and um, 12 of them have been militaries. So citizen security have been developed with this war-like mentality uh, but this is, of course, in, in the frame of an expansive militarization of the state. Here you can see that at least 50% of the ministries right now in Venezuela are military. So the military has been taking or taking more and more positions within the state. So when, when I speak about these two stages, we can say that we have had this first stage of carceral and punitive um, uh, movement by the, state, uh, by, by the state starting from 2010 with the, um, what was called um, this military operative that was called Dispositivo Bicentenario de Seguridad. 
to then the second phase that I call systematic state killings with this new operative that was launched in 2015 that is called Operativo de Liberación del Pueblo. That means oper um, liberation, uh, Operative of Liberation of the People. So you can read all the war discourse that is included in these kind of titles. Um, so what I wanted to highlight here is that um, the, this new phase of militarization that started in 2010, what I wanted to show here is that you can see the steep increase of the incarcerated population from 2009 to 2011. So you can see that we had 30,000 people in prison, mostly men, of course, and then two years after we had 50,000. So that created new social pro, uh, problems such as um, gang, um, prison gangs. And it also produced a new rearrangement um, in, the, in the criminal world. So you, you started to have alliances and pacts between um, gangs just to confront the state. And of course, um, what we had, or the result, was that an increase, an important increase in the homicide rates. So you can see that in 2010, the homicide rate was 45 homicides per 100,000 inhabitants. But um, in, in 2004, we had already 62 homicides per 100,000 inhabitants. So that, that is also a very important increase. And of course, um, we have had this rearrangement of the criminal world, and this um, is part of the diagnosis made by the government. This is an extract um, I'm, sh I'm presenting from a document I got from a police agent that um, it is the, the sort of norms and logic of this Operativo de Liberación del Pueblo. So you can read that um, their diagnosis uh, points to this rearrangement of the criminal world. I can read for you. The constant struggle for the neutralization of these groups that generate va uh, violence carried out by the state through the OLHP. This age there, um, uh, we had the OLP, the Operativo de Liberación del Pueblo, but then one year after it was named OLHP, meaning Operativo de Liberación Humanista, Humanistic, Humanistic for the People. That means that they were reacting to all the denounces of human rights violations, so they only had an H to show that they were caring for all the denunciations that were being made. So um, you can read the discourse of war uh, in, this, in this extract, and then mm, I continue. The OLHP was led, uh, has led these bands to make pacts and alliances between them to commit unlawful acts and to counter this uh, initiative of the government. And then one main objective of the OLP is contribute to search, uh, locate, to the neutralization, disarticulation, and eradications of gangs. So the, um, you, with eradication, I mean, we speak about the eradications of, of, um, of, be, of um, beasts, but not human beings. I mean, so, so criminality is being treated as a, as a, um, as a sort of um, subhuman uh, species that we have to uh, confront. And then, of course, in 2015, and this is the turning point I want to highlight, that 2015 is the turning point where we begin this new stage of massive killings, um, massive state killings. So you can read, for example, this is, a, um, this is the title of a, of a journal that is a very popular journal that is called Ultimas Noticias. Uh, you can read Abatidos. 12, uh, abatidos, that means killed, but in, in a warlike situation. 12 subjects after this deployment of the OLP in El 23 de Enero, that is the barrio where Alex, Alejandro works. And um, so what I want to 
point here is that the state is becoming a violent uh, actor in itself. The state is being responsible of extra legal violence nowadays. If you see this chart, the, um, the blue bar are the killings. And then what I wanted to show here is the important and the steep um, increase in police um, caused death. So in, 2000, in 2014, the police was responsible, and this is the red, um, the red numbers, the police was responsible for 7% of the general violent killings. In 2015, it was responsible for the 10% of the general violent killings, but in, after the, oh, this military operative, in 2016, uh, it was responsible for 21% of the violent deaths. That means that if the state stopped killing, we would have at least 21% less of violent deaths. Um, and consider, for example, um, a comparative approach with Brazil. Brazil in the literature is being known for having the most violent police in the world. But when you consider Brazil, you in the, in the low part of the chart, you can see that Brazil's homicide rate is 30 homicides per 100,000 inhabitants. Venezuela's homicide rates in 2016 was 70 homicides per 100,000 inhabitants, but when you see that the percentage of um, police and military killings, you can see that Brazil, the, poli the, um, the police forces in Brazil are responsible for 7% uh, of the uh, killings in Brazil, of the violent deaths in Brazil, but in Venezuela it's 21%, so it's a huge participation of the state in this violence. And um, if we if we consider oops, if we consider the last report of the um, attorney general, well, uh, the red bar is uh, sixty percent. So most of those that have been killed during these operatives are young men between their eighteen and their twenty-five years. So they are mostly young men from the barrios. Um, and this is also this, um, I thought about this um, progression of stages, also um, from some interviews I've made with uh, police agents, and this is just one I wanted to share with you. I was speaking with a police agent and then I asked him, but what is the justification? Why not put them in jail? Why, why, do, you, why do they have to kill them like that? And then he said, the philosophy of the officers is if we send them to jail, well, it is like a hotel. That's a five-star residence for them. Then they start to commit crimes from there, and they coordinate all the kidnappings, extortion, and robberies. Prisons are overcrowded. That is, all those leaders, those complicated guys have to be eliminated. Then we start to eliminate, eliminate, eliminate to cleanse, especially the popular sectors, the population because in reality, crime has diminished. I recognize that uh, what the state did with this option to violate human rights and to finish off the criminals, to eliminate them, that has made crime decrease. But they have killed enough. Well, I just wanted to finish my presentation, so showing you some pictures. Um, uh, in the neighborhood, in the barrio I'm working right now. So this is the typical entrance. So you can see a war um, vehicle like this just in the entrance of the neighborhood. Well, here you can see the holes of the bullets uh, made by the police just in regular um, houses. So people are starting, it's not very clear there, but people are starting to put in, the, in their fences huge chains and padlocks to protect from the, from the police and the military forces, not from the, delinqu not from the local delinquents um, that they know very well, but from the uh, police uh, forces. And, um, I, and this last picture is a young boy who was killed, and this is the altar that his mother had at home. Thank you so much. And to conclude this, thank you so much, Veronica. Um, to conclude this last uh, part of the uh, presentations, uh, let's welcome David Smelda.
<laughs> uh, he's a professor in the Department of Sociology at Tulane University. Uh, he's a sociologist and international relations scholar uh, working on social mobilization, human rights, and culture in Venezuela. Uh, he's also a senior fellow at WOLA, uh, the Washington Office for Latin America, uh, who is, which is a leading uh, research and advocacy organization on human rights. Uh, he's also the co-editor of Venezuela's Bolivarian Democracy, published in 2011 by Duke University Press. And he has been publishing in Venezuela in some of the major newspapers here in the United States. Um, his contribution uh, today is going to be an analysis of the crisis in a hemispheric context, to see what are the perspectives of a regional solution and also the role of the United States in it. So let's welcome David. Smile. I would like to start by thanking Lena and Joaquin and Andreas for organizing this event. It's really uh, a pleasure to be here. I actually studied here in Chicago, the University of Chicago, and one of the things I always lamented uh, was how little exchange there was between the three research universities in, in the city, if you compare it to, say, Boston or New York or, or LA. And so it's really great to see uh, this collaboration and, and this turnout that you have uh, here today. <clears throat> the um, uh, in, in a lot of ways, 2017 was, I, I think, a really terrible year. I think it's the, it's the, it's the worst year of this crisis, the worst year uh, of Venezuela since I've, I've been there. Um, uh, just, just to uh, briefly review, you know, 2017 saw a four-month protest cycle that led to 120 deaths in, in total. It also saw the election of an unconstitutional uh, constituent assembly or unconstituted ele election of a constituent assembly. Uh, it also saw some unsuccessful elections in October and December, and by unsuccessful, I mean an election that did not actually make the people feel like they were able to express express their will. Um, and I think 2018 were, were, is, is shaping up to be just as bad. The government has moved up the presidential elections and the opposition has de declined to participate in them. And so here again, we're in this crisis of representation, a political crisis, in which I think it's, it's average people that, that, that are the biggest losers. Um, however, I do think that in the past year or so, in 2017, especially 2017, there, was, there were some significant gains in, in the engagement, in international engagement in the Venezuelan crisis. Um, and, and let me just let me just uh, reveal that uh, that a premise of mine and that one of the biggest one of the big problems in Latin America and in Venezuela is U.S. unilateralism. I think that the tendency of the United States to try to try to act on its own and pursue its interests uh, uh, rather than through multilateral bodies or multilateral action, I think, is one of the, one of the key problems. I think we, what we saw in in um, in in two thousand. What we saw in, in 2017, in the first half, the first semester, the first six months of 2017, was, it, was a, a pretty significant effort within the organization of American states to apply the democratic charter to Venezuela. Uh, this was led by a number of countries. It led to a number of discussions. Ultimately, I think it was in, in June, this effort finally failed. There were not the votes to actually invoke the Democratic Charter. But I think uh, having that discussion in that forum was a very positive sign. And I think the discussions are ends in themselves in the sense that they, they contribute to opinion formation. The, um, the Constituent Assembly, of course, proceeded as planned by the government. But immediately in the week, a week and a half after uh, that, something emerged called the Lima Group. The Lima Group is a group of 12 countries, now it's 14, that were concerned with Latin America, or concerned with Venezuela, and discussed it and started to pressure the Venezuelan government. Uh, and most notably, it includes Canada, but does not include the United States. And I think it's a very positive sign and, and, and gives that group uh, credibility. The, uh, another thing that happened is that uh, the sanctions that at one time were just unilateral by the United States, the European Union adopted a version of, of these targeted sanctions, as did Canada. I think the multilateral dimension of these sanctions makes them more effective and gives them more, more uh, credibility. Um, I think also another gain since, since uh, 
uh, December or so, there's been a, there was a dialogue process that took place in the Dominican Republic. And while that dialogue process eventually failed just a couple of weeks ago, I thought it was a significant improvement. If you looked at the detail of the discussion and you looked at the progress that was actually made, it was significantly better than previous dialogue process. And I think that was largely because of the, the, the very tangible involvement of, uh, of the foreign ministers of, of, of regional countries. They were not just observers, they were actually participants and mediators. Um, uh, I've been asked to, to talk about the U.S. in particular as well. I, the, the U.S., of course, since 2015, I, I mean, if, if you go back, the U.S. has had a long-term sort of uh, an, uh, animosity or antagonistic relationship with Chavismo in, in Venezuela. In 2015, they rolled out targeted sanctions against officials that have been accused uh, of corruption or human rights violations. I thought that, that I thought, I think that was the wrong policy at the wrong time. I think it had a very negative impact. I think uh, those of us who are skeptical of them, I think, are vindicated because they coincide with a dramatic deterioration. Basically, these sanctions, I thought they were not well conceived because they had, they were unilateral for one. They had no clear uh, escape mechanism, second. So basically what they did is they raised the exit costs for officials within the Maduro government and made it, made it that much less likely that they would actually negotiate. Um, I think uh, uh, you know, what has happened, it's a little odd because those, those were rolled out in the Obama uh, period. And, and it, we, in, the two, in 2017, we had a really quite paradoxical, interesting context. No, you would think that during the Trump government, immediately things would, would get, uh, there would be a much tougher line on Venezuela. But actually the opposite happened, and that was because there was basically, for most of 2017, there was a, a sort of a, a, a vacuum within the State Department. Uh, the Trump administration didn't believe in the State Department. Rex Tillerson was basically sort of cut off. And, and so basically what you had is you had career, the, the person who really had control over Venezuela policy in the State Department was Tom Shannon. Uh, who is a long-term diplomat, knows the Venezuelan case very well, and with reference to Venezuela, is a moderate. And he and the people that are around him control Venezuela policy and really uh, were able to do what they wanted to do without much interference from the White House or National Security Council. The, um, and so the, they were the ones that, that really were well, uh, uh, willing to take a back seat in the OAS discussion. They were willing to not interfere with the Lima group emerging. Uh, and I think uh, did a lot of behind the scenes multilateral diplomacy around sanctions that got Canada and, and the European Union to participate. In other words, they did, they did the diplomatic work that they, had, they should have done a long time uh, before. But during the, uh, during, the, during the Obama government, there was actually quite a bit uh, uh, more sort of friction between the State Department and, and uh, uh, Marco Rubio and other very strongly conservative Republicans in, in, in the Congress. And, and so it was an interesting period in 2017. Unfortunately, I think it's largely come to an end. The, um, uh, in, in August, the United States rolled out financial sanctions. You know, in, in the wake, within a couple of weeks after the, the, um, uh, the election of the Constituent Assembly and the conformation of that Constituent Assembly, they rolled out financial sanctions, which basically prevented, basically sanctioned any bank or U.S. individual that attempts or that that uh, participates in issuing new debt for Venezuela. Um, uh, I thought at the time, I thought these sanctions were actually quite interesting because of the fact that it was very clear what they did. I thought they, they were preventing something that was very negative and that was basically the fire sale that Venezuela had of, of Venezuela debt. They were, they were selling off debt at 30, 30 40 cents on the dollar. Uh, and, and I thought that they, they were just basically mortgaging Venezuela's future. However, these sanctions, I think, have had uh, 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 a, a negative impact. I mean, I think there's a, there's a big issue with these sanctions, with sanctions in general, but especially with these sanctions, the issue of overcompliance. And that is, you know, these sanctions are, are quite particular and quite specific, and that's good. But if you are a bank, if you are a multilateral bank, you're basically not going to risk it, and you're not going to look at the details, and you're not going to try and figure out, is this going to be sanctioned or not sanctioned? And the, the, ex, the, the impact of these sanctions have been huge. I mean, there's been accounts closed. There's been things you would think have nothing, to, nothing possible to do with these sanctions. But banks, multilateral banks and institutions just play it 
absolutely conservative with these, and I think these have had uh, a negative impact on the economy. No, I mean, I think 90%, 95% of the blame is on the on Maduro government for the economy, but clearly these sanctions are having a negative impact, and they're forcing Venezuela to go into, into default, and that's really affecting the population. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, as I said, I think, you know, this period when uh, the, the sort of the State Department, this year that the State Department had sort of this autonomy uh, uh, away from the Trump administration to kind of determine policy, I think, has basically come to an end. I think um, uh, what's currently on the table is oil sanctions, and you can, you can find almost daily some article about this, about what these would look like. I think that would be very negative. I think that would have a real, a real, Im a really negative impact on uh, average Venezuelans. No, I think uh, it, th there's no way to implement an oil sanction that's not going to impact the average people because that's where 95 percent of uh, uh, Venezuela's income comes from. Um, and there's also uh, the, the military option. This is something that uh, Trump mentioned in August. And this frequently, uh, the, the Secretary of State, in fact, just said, well, actually, that's not on the table. That's something that can be excluded. But you hear different things from different parts of the government. And there are other parts of the government that say, oh, no, no, actually, that's still on the table. And I think there's a very clear danger here. Um, I think um, Venezuela is a very attractive target for a, for a government that had, that government that's in trouble, for a government that has few foreign policy successes and has picked a lot of fights. No, it's picked a fight with North Korea. It's picked a fight, uh, you know, with Mexico, uh, with, with Iran, and it's really going to be hard for uh, this government to demonstrate that it has anything to show for that. And I think that is one of the reasons this government has taken up the, this this situation of Venezuela. Of course, they get a lot of pressure uh, from from the anti-Castro uh, legislators, but. Um, uh, I, I, I worry that this is this would be an uh, that they see this as a case that they could show a clear victory and portray themselves as sort of democracy promoters around the world. And I think it's something that we all have to be vigilant about. I think if you uh, if you look at if you look at the discourse, uh, uh, especially sort of far right discourse uh, in and around Washington, you will see things that have a common denominator. They all try to make Venezuela into a global threat. And so Venezuela, of course, is a, is a terrible situation. It's not a real threat to the United States. It's not a real threat to anybody except for maybe Colombia with the refugees. There is that international context to it. But that's not really a compelling reason for military action. But if you look, if you look around, there's a constant push to say that Venezuela is actually a narco dictatorship that is, is responsible for the drugs coming into the United States. No, clearly they have a problem, like many governments in the, in the region, with, with narcotics, especially Mexico. And, and, uh, but referring to the narco state, it's just, I, I don't think it is the right direction. You, last year there was a whole discussion about uh, the Venezuelan government giving passports to terrorists. It's something that if you looked at it for more than 10 minutes, it didn't even make sense. Uh, a few years back, there was this idea that there were Iranian missiles in, in Venezuela, you know, in the Paraguay Peninsula. You know, all of these things have a common denominator, and they, what they do is they say the Venezuela situation is actually a global danger. And so that's something that could, could eventually uh, uh, be used to um, justify military action. I think it's something that we need to be very, very uh, uh, aware of and critical of as it happens. I think what does need to happen in Venezuela, I think there has to be multilateralism. Uh, I don't think that we should just let Venezuelans work this out. They can't. Venezuelans can't work this out because they can't vote. The, the, the system is, is not uh, in, in a, in a situ they are not in a situation in which they can actually express their opinion. This is something that I think uh, uh, is, is a situation in which the international community has an important role. But I think that role should be multilateral. No, I think, I think the elections, if they do not meet standards, international standards should be uh, rejected by the region. I think uh, that there should be sanctions, but the sanctions should be well formulated. The sanctions should, uh, um, they should, they should, uh, they shouldn't affect everyone. No, they should just affect some leaders, not all leaders, some leaders. They should have a mechanism whereby they can be rolled back, you know, so that they can actually produce some sort of change in course. And they should be communicated clearly. A lot of these issues of, of overcompliance have to do with uh, lack of communication.
Um, I think, uh, so I think a sanctions program, but one that's actually oriented towards change and not simply oriented towards expressing a rejection of Venezuela or saying we're doing something, you know, something that's that, 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 uh, actually oriented towards some kind of change. And finally, something that's not part of the discussion nearly enough is the issue of transitional justice, you know. Uh, there's a tendency to only use the term pressure, to only talk about sticks and not carrots, in, in international re relations and international diplomacy. I think, but this type of situation is not gonna be solved unless there's some sort of pact, there's some sort of negotiation. I think the, the negotiators, the, 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 Republic, the Dominican Republic uh, um, dialogues are still in place and, and I think they're ready, that's good. And I think what has to be on the table as well is, is some kind of program of trans transitional justice. Something that's gonna lower the exit costs of the people that have power who might be ready to, but are just fearful uh, of what could happen to them. Of course, this is a very, very difficult uh, issue. You know, on the one hand, you want something that avoids impunity. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, can't, you can't just uh, let people off for of crimes they may have committed. But on the other hand, I think there's very valid concerns among uh, people uh, in the government that there could be a witch hunt. So something that provides some sort of assurance and negotiation that people will be treated fairly in a transition. I think this is what was key in Colombia. This is key in the, in the, in the, in the result in the South Africa conflict. But of course, these things are very, very uh, uh, controversial as, we saw, as, we, as we've seen in, in Colombia recently. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so before we start like um, reading uh, and uh, asking some of your questions, uh, we're going to ask um, uh, one to each of the uh, presenters on our part, and then we're going to open to the index cards where you guys have been written your question, writing your questions. Um, so, so let's start in the order that we did the presentations, and um, for Alejandro Velasco, the question that we want to uh, start with is a truly historical one, uh, <laughs> taking the advantage that you're a historian. So um, the question will be like, um, if you can talk a little bit more about the Punto Fijo Pact. So the Punto Fijo Pact was this uh, bipartisan uh, order uh, that the um, uh, ADE y COPE established uh, during most of the 20th century. Uh, and actually represented a moment of democratic stability for, for Venezuela. So the question is to what extent the collapse of that Punto Fijo Pact kind of enabled the rise of Hugo Chavez and the Bolivarian Revolution. If you can like um, talk about the origins of Chavismo and Bolivarianismo in relation to the Punto Fijo Pact and that bipartisan arrangement between ADE and COPE. Um, yeah, so I think the, there's a very direct correlation, which is, as I was trying to mention in the presentation, that the 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 pact of democracy between Acción Democrática and COPE that was consolidated in the 1970s, although it had its origins in 1958, um, part of what it allowed and disallowed was a sense of alternatives within its within itself to be able to adapt. What I mean by that is um, it began in the late 50s as basically a way to create a situation where, as had happened in a previous era in the 1940s, um, the political parties of the time basically couldn't agree to agree, and so that opened the way for military dictatorship, which then lasted for 10 years. And so their initial attempts was to come to a pact to agree that they were not going to basically come after each other. Um, and on that basis, we're gonna establish some political stability, which then would, would on the one hand, prevent these kind of insurrectionary impulses um, from coming to the fore, but on the other hand, also allow for a concerted policy effort to, you know, to modernize the country. Um, unfortunately, what happened is that that pact um, became very ossified. And there's no greater sort of example of that ossification than the fact that the two last presidents of the Punto Fijo era, and it was called Punto Fijo because that's the name of the house where this pact was signed in 1958. Um, the two last presidents were also presidents who had served earlier in late 1960s and um, mid 1970s. And so basically what that showed is that there was no internal mechanism, few internal mechanisms for the renewal of leadership. 
um, which then, of course, was brought more broadly indicative that there was very little sense about the system of being able to transform itself to adapt to new realities and, um, uh, and situations. So that's on the one hand, sort of that the 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 stability, which was at one time seen as uh, as as very, of course, exceptional in Latin America, um, in the 1990s was seen as having highly corrupted roots, not corruption in the kind of sense of you know finances and work, but that the, its roots that had been up previously upheld as the reasons for its success, strong leadership, strong parties, um, you know, uh, dependence on, uh, on oil, were now exactly seen as the reasons for its failure, right? So it's this kind of, you know, uh, 180 that was done interpretively between the 1980s and 1990s. Um, the larger reason why that allows um, you know, Chavismo to emerge is because it creates this, uh, you know, the this, this, this situation where there are no alternatives within that system. The only alternative has to come outside of it, yeah. right? And so what it does is it exhausts any possibilities for any kind of internal um, reform, which therefore allows only an external agent to be able to catalyze a, uh, a, a not just a reformer agenda, but a revolutionary agenda, right? So basically, the collapse of this ossified system allows for the, and not only allows, but to some extent creates the opportunity for a much more sort of radical revolutionary discourse and practice to emerge. So that's on the one hand. The other part of it too, thinking historically as to you know, how this plays into, um, into the rise of Chavismo, is that it fixes in time for Chavismo a very uh, direct, palpable, historical enemy, which is everything that happened before the rise of Chavismo. Right, so you can easily um, uh, cordon off this, you know, these 40 years between 1958 and 1998 as the source of all the problems of Venezuela um, and perfectly in line with a revolutionary discourse that says now Venezuela begins anew and uh, unsurprisingly it does so by calling itself initially the Movimiento Quinta Republica, the Fifth Republic movement in contrast to the Fourth Republic which is what had just passed, right? So basically, uh, in terms of creating the conditions for um, for the rise of Chavismo, it did so by uh, you know by by ossifying itself in a way that did not renew that did not allow for renewal, but also then allowed and in fact necessitated a much more radical sort of revolutionary discourse um, to emerge, which was you know highly um, attractive to significant sectors of the population that very uh, directly felt the impacts of, as I was describing before, the boom and bust cycle that had left them, uh, you know, completely bereft, right? So, you know, finally, just close this with, what if, it, in a similar way as what was initially seen as the, um, the strengths of the Punta Fija era, the two-party system era, became to be seen as its faults, I think that we're eventually going to see those strengths that it's what some people imagine as strengths early in the Chavez era to be seen as, as its fault, meaning that it basically wrapped itself in a discourse where it had always to condition its legitimacy against the experience of the prior 40 years. And here's where Veronica's research is so significant. Not only are the statistics that you know, she, should, she showed really dramatic, but they're very familiar to populations in barrios that had experiences in the, 19, in the 1980s and 1990s. Not at the scale of which they're experiencing them now, but the idea of the state as the enemy, it's not new. But if you've built your entire reputation or legitimacy on the basis that you're not like them, this of course collapses on its face. Right, so insofar as uh, you know, the early Chavista discourse was all about differentiating itself from those previous 40 years, the more it resembles those previous 40 years, it undermines its credibility among those sectors that had previously um, you know, supported it. And then just finally, the, you know, the fact that there is this longer lasting sort of trust gap that I was mentioning before impedes some sort of full crossover um, from dis dejection, deception, you know, um, uh, from dejection to then aligning much more frontally with the opposition. Uh, thank you so much, Alejandro, for the, the answer. Uh, we have prepared a number of questions, but uh, basically to facilitate the, the discussion with the, the questions presented by the public, we're going to just limit to one question per speaker, right? So I'm going to ask a, a question to, to David. Uh, <clears throat> I was actually recently reading his David's piece in the New York Times, the, an op-ed piece uh, that you published in in January of this year, right? and basically 
making two fundamental points. One was the point that um, a military, U.S. military intervention or U.S.-sponsored military intervention in Venezuela is, first of all, unviable in terms of uh, potential outcome, and secondly, uh, not really advisable politically in terms of the results that it might produce. And secondly, you were arguing in favor of um, uh, supporting particular type of sanctions that, in your views, will favor a diplomatic solution and eventually, a, actually, a, um, I might say, a fair and legal electoral process. Right? That's pretty much it's, I'm summarizing well your, your arguments in that piece. So in that context, I, I'd like to, to ask you two related questions. Right? If we are concerned with issues of peace and democracy in Latin America, broadly speaking, uh, we have the case of Honduras, the recent Honduran elections, right, where basically a number of very uh, serious uh, concerns have been raised pertaining the, the legality of the election, the legitimacy of the election, um, issues of authoritarianism in Honduras, issues of massive repression against opponents. So more or less, we're talking about the similar charges that are actually level, level against the Venezuelan government, right? So in that light, uh, is this, this particular position of supporting sanctions to Venezuela but not supporting sanctions or particular pressures to democratization of Honduras consistent with the larger idea of promoting democracy and peace in Latin America? And secondly, um, I'd like to, uh, if you could actually speak a little bit on the if there are actually fundamental differences in the foreign policy objectives of the Obama administration and the Trump administration, as reflected in the recent statement by Secretary of State uh, Tillerson. Right? So those are my, my two related questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The, um, uh, and those are very good questions. I'll do my best uh, to to answer them. The uh, Honduras versus Venezuela. The, uh, you know, I don't think, I don't think it's consistent. You know? I mean, I think, I just wrote something yesterday in, in the, the Latin, Latin American Advisor that's published by the Inter-American Dialogue to, to that effect, basically just arguing that the, the way that Honduras has just been sort of given, given a buy, I think really sort of undermines or undermines or, or makes more difficult the uh, you know policies towards Venezuela. You know because I think I think these policies uh, you know are most effective if they have some sort of consistency, some sort of moral element to them. And of course, it's it's very clear that why why is why is the U.S. giving Honduras a buy uh, and not Venezuela? I don't think it's because of the objective characteristics of what they did. I mean, I think the the election in Honduras, I think, is, is, was clearly a sham. And so, uh, and I, I think the Secretary General of the OAS, I think, was right in calling for new elections. But the U.S., I think, basically squelched that by suddenly recognizing the elections. I think they put an end to that. And so I think, I think that was very negative. I don't support that. And I think that that kind of, that level of hypocrisy, you know, I think is, 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 a, is a real problem, you know? I don't think of it in terms of, well, only countries who are not uh, only countries who are not hypocritical can therefore act in terms of uh, other situations because I think that would that would basically uh, wipe out international relations in general, you no? Know? Because every country has skeletons in its closet and, and a certain degree of, of hypocrisy. But I do think that in terms of of the strength of what they do, and in, in terms of the effectiveness, I think it, I think it's it's a clear it, it's clear that 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 I think has a, has a negative, deleterious impact on that. I think in terms of, you know, the way I think of, of the United States. I mean, I think the United States has, uh, in, in general, I think of social actors, including states, as uh, uh, you know, motivated by material, instrumental interests, but also at certain points, certain moments motivated by ideal and and moral interests. And so I think that the Obama government was, you know, had a certain degree of sort of liberal interna internationalism that, that guided it and that sometimes could uh, 
uh, have uh, an impact on their foreign policy. I think that the Trump government has something a little bit more rudimentary, more of a manifest destiny type, which is a moral, a moral argument, no, but it's a, it's a, it's a very primitive one. And, and so I think, you know, what, what that means, I think all of that gives opportunity for those of us in civil society or those of us who are members of, of NGOs or organizations that try to pressure the, the U.S. government is, you know, if you notice everything they do and they say, they try to present it in sort of these moral global leadership type of terms, terms take that and turn it back on them, no? So if they say, okay, well, we're re we, we want to return to democracy in Venezuela, but, you know, their actions say that what they really want is regime change, well, then point that out. If they want to put forward sanctions, oil sanctions, because they say – they use logics that say things like, oh, well, uh, there's a short term, you know, that would be short term pain for long term gain because the, the population would suffer in the short term, but then they would gain. Point out that uh, that actually has not worked out that way in Cuba, in Zimbabwe, in Syria. No. So point out the, 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 the failures in logic, make it difficult for them. And, and I think there can be some swaying. Uh, of, a, of, a, of a, but but you know this is this is geopolitics and I think they have you know their own real politic interests involved. Um, but I think uh, you know there's always some sort of moral discourse around that, and that's what gives gives us in civil society some purchase to try and push back and have some kind of impact. Thank you. And the last of our questions, uh, so then we can uh, start um, asking the questions that you guys uh, have sent in the index cards will be for Veronica. So um, in your uh, 10 minutes presentation, you were very clear about the role of the state uh, with the statistics and your own field work and your colleagues. So my question will be um, in, in, in a situation of tremendous polarization and where there's a dynamic where there are ve uh, many sectors involved, the question will be, so what's the role of the opposition and what Alejandro during the presentation talked about their insurrectionary uh, strategies. So can you uh, speak about like how they, uh, the opposition and the different sectors, how can we understand uh, the diversity and variety in the opposition and the strategies of violence and insurrection that they have also put in motion that contribute to this dynamic and this escalation of the conflict? Well, I will say that departing from the coup d'etat in 2002, it was very clear that the opposition was willing to take power through un unconstitutional ways. So it's very clear that, um, I mean, that movement and the, clearly the opposition was linked to, to, to violence. Um, I will say that we have different faces also um, in the Bolivarian Revolution. So after 2004 and the um, rise of oil prices and after the referendum, we have a sort of stabilization of the Bolivarian Revolution. And then we had almost 10 years of high, very high oil prices. And then we have the massive social programs known as Misiones Sociales. So we had a sort of um, political stability. So the opposition also learned that the un unconstitutional ways were not the, the, um, the way. I mean, they were discredited, delegitimized. No, I mean, the, the support of the coup d'etat was, um, I will say, um, not very important. But um, through this um, history, and specifically after Hugo Chavez's death, with all the closing of the institutional channels, I would say that the streets were the fundamental 
platform to to develop politics. So of course, protests are becoming more and more violent because there are no institutional ways to solve the problem. So of course, but I will say the opposition is very diverse at the same time. I would not generalize. You can say that there are some uncontrolled sectors of the opposition. For example, if you think about the recent um, four months protests that we experience violence in the streets. There were young people that was called La Resistencia who were in the streets, who were, I mean, who were violent, who closed the streets. And um, so people, I mean, people in the middle were, were just like prisoners from this um, micro regimes of violence, but also from the, I mean, from the, from the, a new, a very evident authoritarian government that is that was being um, taking place. So I will say that there is a, a lot of diversity, and um, and that's it. So before we start with some of the questions, we have here actually two comments, uh, and then we have a lot of questions. So I'm going to read the comments first. So in the audience, Dr. Scioli Zambrano, one of the Supreme Court judges selected by the National Assembly and who had to flee the country as the other judges to avoid incarceration. Now she's here in Chicago. And the other uh, comment comes actually in the form of a question. Uh, it is, uh, was the exclusion of speakers sympathetic to the government intentional? Do you feel that is justified to limit the conversation? So obviously the comment is uh, asking us to reveal our criteria. Uh, so I'm gonna just uh, say more about how we decided uh, on who to invite. Um, our main criteria was to invite um, academics uh, that do uh, research, either uh, archival research or field work research and that their work was the product of that research not just um, uh, writing opinions or like um, theoretical approaches to the conflict, but uh, people who have been conducting research on Venezuela uh, for many years and who has a robust uh, public work published about it, and that also uh, knows uh, the uh, American public and the American audience. Uh, that, that was on the one hand, that like the general uh, criteria. And then we started to think about uh, different approaches to the country and to the crisis itself and trying to uh, find a historical perspective, also trying to find like a, a more internal per perspective about the dynamics and finally a more international one. Um, and obviously, uh, in um, about a topic that's, that is so polarizing as this, uh, opinions about the sympathies or the uh, ideologies behind uh, your work uh, is always going to be controversial. So we obviously couldn't like uh, satisfy every single one. And our main uh, criteria that we tried to satisfy was precisely to pr to contribute uh, from the academic point of view, defining academic work as, as work based on research uh, and that has produced a work that is published and that has circulated among peers and colleagues and the general public as well. Uh, so I don't know if you, any of you guys wants to talk about your sympathies. <laughs> Please do, now is the time. I'll say something. Um, I'm sure there are folks in the room who have the exact opposite view, that there's not enough uh, like anti-chavismo here. Um, yeah. And so, you know, this is something, uh, I started graduate school in 2000. Um, my first talk on Venezuela was, I think, right around 2002. And it was titled Venezuela in Crisis, right? Which is also the title <laughs> of this presentation. The point is to say that, you know, which is particularly sort of piquant as an historian to think about, you know, how sort of continu continuous um, uh, sort of tropes of, of crisis enter and, and don't enter. But I think your larger point is, is well taken that uh, sort of a discourse and larger narrative of crisis always unleashes um, tremendously uh, polarized reactions. And to that extent, you know, sort of anchoring the work that I do in research in popular sectors 
one of the things that I, I, I always say is, I've never heard such strong strident criticism of the government. I'm talking to like my family's hyper opposition. Um, I'm from Venezuela originally. Uh, I've never heard more strident uh, opposition to the government than from popular sectors because they have a huge stake um, and they had, they continue to have a huge stake in seeing this thing through and they also know that regardless of what happens, they are going to bear the brunt of any crisis, whether it's from 2002 to 2018 as they are now. Um, and so, you know, to some extent, uh, sort of a, a uh, you know, critique of the government um, is actually far more, uh, has much more fidelity um, among a certain sector of the population that certainly long supported what was going, continued to, to imagine sort of the era of Chavismo as highly um, you know, positive for their lives, um, but are completely decepcionados, right? They're as, as one would expect. Um, and so I, I don't think that, you know, any, I don't think that criticism on its own sake is, is a lack of sympathy. I think the opposite is true. Um, I think that sympathy isn't a, shouldn't be a derivative of, sort of government action, but what is, what is happening on the ground. And I think what is happening on the ground is very complicated. Um, and it is not as simple to say as like everybody opposes the government. This is why I was st stressing the point of polarization, and perhaps polarization is, a, is, a, is, a, is not the correct word to think about it in these terms, which is to say, you know, you can have huge critiques of the government without also asking for regime change, right? And I think that that's the needle that needs to be thread um, by people who have an interest in seeing Venezuela emerge from this moment um, such that we can have our next. I would like to say something as well. Um, yeah, thank you for this question. The, <clears throat> I, I personally, I don't work with a partisan perspective. No, I don't, I don't work with a perspective of trying to uh, support the opposition of the government. I'm not trying to do research that counterbalances the United States or imperialism or somebody else. I work. I do work with a political perspective. That political perspective uh, uh, is based on the idea of popular sovereignty. I think that people have the right to choose their form of government, and they have the right to be respected in their basic integrity. I for I had a very long leash with for Chavismo. Uh, for a very long time, not because I found it a very convincing form of government, uh, but because I thought the people supported that, and I think the people have a right to make their own mistakes and learn from them. Uh, I think I've become much more critical of Chavismo when they've really shown that they have no intention of having fair elections, and I think that started uh, or, or became absolutely manifest in, in October 2016. The um, I think uh, uh, in the end, I think all people uh, uh, need to be treated as human beings. And, I, and I, when I say I try to treat people as human beings, I mean I treat them in all of their vices and virtues. I think portraying somebody as the other, portraying somebody as the absolute evil other is dehumanizing. I also think that treating somebody as a romantic, noble savage is also dehumanizing. I think that uh, only portraying people in, their, in the full gamut of their vices and virtues is, is really a, a treatment uh, of another person as a human being. I will only add that um, my choice has been historically, historically for complexity. So I don't have, uh, I have, in my written papers, I don't have like easy answers or easy positions. I try to just show all the diversity, nuances in the different positions. So what I'm trying to, and also I have tried in all, in all these years of working with popular, popular sectors is to show also the position of those who have not visible voices. So all my research is linked to the popular neighborhoods. That is why um, I've been writing a lot about young people in the, in the barrios. And also that is why I'm denouncing right now uh, all these massive state killings. Thank you. I'm going to start reading some of the questions we have here. Um, the first question reads, um, quote, unquote, are legitimate and fair elections possible anytime soon in Maduro's Venezuela? Signed, Edgar I. So for anyone 
Uh, are they possible? Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, Venezuela has has an electronic platform that's really very good. It has a, a system of audits that I think works very well. Um, is it likely? I kind of doubt it, uh, just because I think the government is in a situation that it knows that it can't have legitimate elections, uh, really free and fair elections, because it's going to be voted out. And they're very afraid. On the one hand, they want to keep their institution, their revolution going. On the other hand, they're very afraid of what's going to happen. And so I think what has to happen, there has to be pressure from the opposition, from the international community, to actually have elections from the population as well, and, and get to the point that uh, the government, either now or further down the road, is willing to go to elections that have some semblance of, of freedom and fairness. Thank you. Um, the next question reads, what is the current status of the National Assembly? Is the new Constituent Assembly drafting a new constitution? Why does Maduro want a new constitution? It's not signed. Um, the Constituent Assembly is not drafting a new constitution. Um, it's, I mean, it's it's interesting because it's um, it's actually one of the very briefly little tiny, again historical overview. In terms of thinking about Chavismo and its history, there really are two major sort of uh, political ideological trends. The first is what I mentioned, sort of participatory um, protagonistic democracy, which was enshrined in a 1999 constitution that, um, you know, that, that Chavez put forward and was um, you know, voted in. But the second one, again, after 2005 and sort of a much more robust embrace um, of, of socialism as a state policy, the idea of participatory and protagonistic democracy came to uh, became more and more difficult in the context of a a, a growingly strong state, um, and so what you had was a series of attempts by Chavez and Chavismo to reform the constitution that they put into place in 1999. The first attempt in 2007, in fact, failed. It was the first major electoral defeat on the part of um, of Chavez, and then they pushed it through in a different um, election a couple of years. It's later, 2009, right? Um, uh, but basically what that uh, set in motion was a collision course between two very different visions about what the, what the new Venezuela should be. Should it, uh, uphold these participatory protagonistic principles which were kind of content neutral, or to um, David's point, you know, to sort of uh, upheld the idea of a people deciding how they wanted to live, or should it be much more content specific? Should it be about sort of socialism? What we actually want is socialism, and if you're not part of that, then you're not part of this. Um, and so that is to say that uh, that that set into motion this collision course between two competing strands of of chavismo, that um, that. Actually, after Chavez died, one of his last major speeches was to you know, tell Maduro, you know, Nicolás, you have to bring forward the communal state, which was to you know be, to be seen as sort of the the, you know, the final stage of a of a socialist project where the state would would sort of wither away, right, and would give rise to these you know, um, you know, popular organized uh, sectors. You can't do that in a in a, in a petro state that easily, number one, and you also can't do that in a petro state that had um, really implanted itself not on the basis of a new ideology, but really on, on the basis of deepening a kind of consumerist mentality, which was through the distribution of rents in, in a very direct way. All that was to say that the constituent assembly emerges, one reading would be to satisfy the impulses of that second strand of Chavismo that much more directly says that 1999 constitution is not good for the purposes of generating a socialist um, you know, future. But in fact, the, its context was uh, uh, the, uh, the lack of, um, uh, of electoral support. Um, uh, which had been manifest in 2016, so it was seen by sectors of, especially those who had long been clamoring for precisely this kind of thing, more radical sectors of Chavismo, as basically a ploy, which was uh, confirmed when uh, basically those who were elected to the Constituent Assembly were almost exclusively uh, Maduro supporters. Within the broad constellation of Chavismo, they were basically all Maduristas. And there were significant protests in the night of the, the when the results were announced because radical sectors of Chavismo were completely sh uh, shut out. 
Um, and so, you know, the, it was very clear that even though it had this underlying intent of, well, let's let's actually move towards socialism, the 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 constituent assembly was really a, a maneuver on the part of Maduro to consolidate control, both from the opposition and also from these recalcitrant sectors within Chavismo. Um, and so, it's not a surprise that we haven't seen, you know, much move in the direction of a of a new constitution because that was not the actual intent, and certainly wasn't the composition of the constituent assembly. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, there is um, a question addressed directly to to Veronica. Um, it reads, "Quote unquote: Is there anything being done against the OLHP? Also, how do people cope?" with such high levels of violence in Venezuela? Do neighborhoods have certain curfews or is there no, or is there no communication? It's signed by Jeffrey Arellano and it's actually a, there's an, a related question as well. I'm gonna read it right now. During the new phase of militarization in Venezuela today, has freedom of speech been impacted? If so, how? Signed by Guillermina Hernandez. Well, um, I will say that pe um, people in the popular, in the barrios, have learned to deal with violence. Um, to deal with a violence that is not only produced by state agents or by police forces, but, but by, by the local delinquents as well. So women especially um, have developed different strategies to protect their children or even, I mean, there, there is a wide uh, scope of strategies um, to deal with this daily violence. Some of them are similar as in a warlike context. For example, people um, in order to go out or just to develop the minimum routines of daily life, they have to be calling everywhere, calling everyone just to know if they can go, if um, the local gangs are not uh, shooting among them. So, so violence in the barrios is not new, and that is also part of the problem. I mean, it's becoming um, visible right now, but in... If you do research, even during the 90s, we had already this kind of, of violence. What I would say it's new is this um, new level of crime organization and this new level of state-sponsored violence that is very extreme in certain um, barrios. So also the experience of violence is depending, um, depends on gender, for example. Mothers have very different preoccup um, worries and preoccupations compared to, to, to men in general or to young men. Young men who are not local delinquents can be um, confused or taken by, a, by an enemy, so they are um, just um, sort of um, falling in the violent dynamic in, in the barrios. So it depends on gender, it depends also in the barrio where you live. Some barrios are historically um, very well consolidated and very well um, organized, so, and people are able to resist and to negotiate with local um, young delinquents. Other barrios are more recent, so people are more vulnerable to to this, um, to this violence. One thing I would say uh, that is becoming very evident in the barrio where I work is the feeling of uh, social abandonment. So people feel that they, don't, they do not have any institution where to go to denounce. So people are getting used to all these police eruptions and when I speak and, I, and when I say that, I'm, rec um, I'm re uh, rec uh, recollecting all these testimonies with the hope to have justice in the future. Well, people don't have not much um, faith that justice can be done. So there is a, a very important sense of abandonment and, and um, resignation. In other matters, it depends also on the local organizations and the civil society um, 
pres uh, presence in the barrios. Other barrios, for example, women have organized themselves to negotiate with the local malandros, with the local delinquents, so they have made a sort of um, ceasefire pacts. And they act as um, really as a force. Uh, so it is also very diverse. The question of, of freedom, I will say uh, that people more and more are um, applying a sort of personal or auto-censorship, because indeed people are afraid. So the more and more um, you can see that journalists are, um, I mean, they are very prudent with what they publish, um, also, the fact that when you do research, you are not able to have access to official information. So you have to develop all sort of informal ways to get information. For example, try to be a friend of a police agent so he can give you all the information in, I mean, not officially. So th I will say that there is um, the more and more uh, sort of... Um, censorship and lack of, uh, of freedom. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I want to summarize two questions on the international context. Um, the first one reads, Rex Tillerson recently toured US allied countries in Latin America. Those, one of those countries, Peru, decided not to allow Maduro to attend the La Cumbre de las Americas, the Summit of the Americas. Argentina and Uruguay also acted against the Maduro government. Is multilateralism viable in an increasingly bipolar Latin America that is pro-US and anti-US? Okay, I thought there was two questions. The, uh, and I think Alejandro could answer this one as, as well as I could. The, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, uh, uh, anytime I think the Secretary of State goes to a region like this, to, to Latin America, I think you have to take a step back and, and applaud that. I think that's good. That's what you want, no? That's what you want. You want them to actually be talking and communicating with Latin America partners, uh, Latin American uh, countries. Uh, I think that uh, moderates U.S. policy. I think it makes it more intelligent. I think it makes it more effective. The um, I, I personally, the, the issue of disinviting Nicolas Maduro uh, to, to the, the Summit of the Americas, I, I don't agree with that. I don't think that was the right move. I think, I think that's a, you know, it's an interesting rebuke. I think it's a well-deserved rebuke on the part of the Maduro government, and it's, it clearly hurts them. But I think it also, it also uh, takes away an opportunity to engage the Maduro government. No, I think there's always this, this overemphasis on pressure and not enough emphasis on, on engagement. And I think, you know, have, they, 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 they're missing the chance to have Maduro around the table in which uh, uh, other countries could directly engage and Maduro could defend him, himself in, in kind. Um, you know, I think uh, Argentina and Uruguay have their own interests uh, in this as well. I think um, I can't, you don't think that can be just simply reduced to U.S. pressure. I think Macri, uh, to a certain extent, is, is out Trump's Trump in, in a lot of ways. And, and I don't think his line has changed much from, because of U.S. pressure. And, and I think Uruguay is a country that I think has had a very interesting uh, um, a line with, with Venezuela. I think it's been very constructive and very prudent. In, in its engagement with Venezuela. I am not actually sure what they did recently. I, I missed that, but um, I think there, that's another country that I don't think is, is necessarily directly influenced by the United States in, in, uh, in, in such a way. I think, I think they have a pretty independent line. Thank you. This question is for Alejandro Velasco. He reads, do you assess, how do you assess the actions taken by Barack Obama versus Donald Trump against the government of Venezuela? Maybe I disagree a little bit with David here. Um, I think that the absence of a clear exit strategy on some of these sanctions does not mean that, they're, that they are uh, ill-formed. I think that the absence of exit strategies means that there is an, the only exit strategy is regime change. I mean, that there, and that, I think that that's been clear to me for, um, since certainly the, the Trump era. Insofar as 
the sanctions under Obama, I think that they initially sought to change behavior, um, right? That's what you want in sanctions, or that's at least what's sort of explicitly articulated. These kinds of sanctions, which are extremely effective because they strike exactly at the place that most affects the viability of the Maduro government to stay in power, which is its, um, its uh, access to, to new cash, um, are not intended to have the Maduro government you know, change its ways. I, uh, you know, I was recently reminded of something that um, George W. Bush said in the lead up to the Iraq invasion, which is, I'm not saying that this is the lead up to the, to the Venezuela invasion, although David's comments, you know, give me pause in this regard. But he, you know, somebody asked him like, are all these sanctions and all these kind of stipulations that you're uh, putting on, on, the, on, on Iraq, um, aren't they just geared towards regime change? And his response was, look, if they do all the things that we've articulated, then that will mean that the regime has changed. But of course, they're impossible to actually do because they're not, you know, they're not seeking that. The aim is actually to change the government. And I think that's where we are now. Um, and so, you know, in, in that sense, I think that there's a huge difference between what's going on under, under Obama, who sort of believed, at least as, as um, uh, as, as David, I think, rightly mentioned, that there was some engagement possible in terms of moder moderating behavior versus this moment, which is m much more explicitly to my mind about regime change and, and you know, aligning that constellation of geopolitical forces, which you just mentioned in terms of what's happened in the region over the last two years, which is a complete turn to the, you know, not complete, but a significant turn to the right in many different ways, right? In Brazil, basically, you have a parliamentary coup um, with a president who has, had, you know, has below 2% support and a, a system that has completely discredited itself because even though it was ostensibly gearing towards you know, cleaning out corruption, it's only selectively done so. Um, certainly in the case of, of Argentina, you have a very direct sort of neoliberal kind of agenda being in place there. In Chile, you have a, you know, uh, a re-election of a, of, a, of a sort of right-wing president. Um, and in Peru, right, you know, you have Kuczynski, who ostensibly was being hailed as sort of like the Lima group leader and the rest of it, pardoning Fujimori, right, to stay in power. Right, and then Honduras is the other case. So you know, this is not a question about the preservation of democracy. Let's just dispense with that. Dispense with that theory. It's a really about the pr the promotion of a particular kind of vision of the world. Um, and uh, you don't have to be conspiratorial. You just have to have an historical memory and a sense of how geopolitics works to realize that this is what's happening. Now, does that? therefore dismiss any kind of critique that could be levied against the government? No, but it does mean that it has to be taken into, the larger context has to be taken into consideration when articulating, especially sort of an outcomes-based um, understanding of, of policy at the geopolitical level. Can I just clarify something? <laughs> These are some points that Alejandro and I talk about frequently. The, <laughs> the, um, uh, one, I just want to clarify, when I was talking about sanctions and the lack of an exit strategy, I was not referring to that the United States didn't have a lack, of, didn't have an exit strategy. I was saying that there was no exit mechanism provided for those who are sanctioned. Therefore, it is not going to lead to change in behavior. Rather, if, if it leads to any change in behavior, it's going to lead to a hardening. And so, I don't think that if if the sanctions, the 2015 sanctions, were conceived of in terms of regime change, I think they were very ill-conceived because I think they really strengthened the regime and I think we've seen the same mechanism in Cuba and Zimbabwe and Syria where I think sanctions actually strengthen strengthen regime so I don't think it's uh, you know whether it's regime change I mean there, there's there's kind of a catch-22 there when you have a government that only has 20 25 percent popularity and you do something to push it to democracy it's pretty clear that that's going to lead to regime change and so so in the end it can be a little bit hard to, hard to parse that out and I think what, what has to happen is, is that's up to us in civil society to try and, to try and force that. The gov governments are always going to use moral discourses. Of course, their intentions, I agree with uh, Alejandro, their intentions are always going to be regime change and real politic. I just don't care a whole lot about intentions. I don't really believe that that's, that's uh, what's most important. I'm, I always sort of assume that they're going to uh, have some sort of material uh, type uh, uh, um, uh, intentions, but I think the the point, for example, on the the financial sanctions. Well, uh, the reason I 
I thought that those were interesting back in August and September was not because I thought, not because I admired the intentions of the people that created them, but because they actually did have a clearly articulated escape clause. Now, so I don't, I don't care about the intentions. I care about whether I think it's going to work. As it actually turns out, I think the intentions do come around and, 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 and bit this because uh, the, the government, the, the State Department, the United States government was very, very vague about communicating this. It doesn't really seem to care. They almost sort of see this collateral damage created by overcompliance as kind of like a, a side benefit when actually it's something that makes what should be a scalpel into a chainsaw. And so, it, uh, uh, so, so there is that caveat. I mean, I, I, I try to look at a policy, what impact I think it's gonna have beyond intentions, but of course, intentions can come around and I think have an impact on them. Um, <clears throat> just gonna read a, a commentary here. And I think the question has been addressed, but I'll just read the commentary. And then perhaps the final question. Um, so uh, the commentary reads, sanctions, quote unquote, sanctions, whether unilateral or multilateral, cause suffering and death. They, are also, they also perpetuate a long history of economic and political intervention from the, quote unquote, West into the sovereignty of the global South. How can we commit ourselves to grassroots, grassroots radical change in Venezuela that does not involve imperialism? Uh, I'll just start quickly. Oh, actually, you should start. I will say that also there are um, different levels. So what we are living in Venezuela is really suffering from an authoritarian regime. And what is becoming more and more evident is that the government has um, less shame to show itself as a dictatorship. So uh, I will say that there is a sense of, of being unable to confront this military power. So I do not agree with these kind of sanctions, but it's very clear that Venezuelans, um, by ourselves, we cannot deal with this situation. So uh, we do need the support and the social uh, pressure for other countries to go out from this uh, situation. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, I think that to the question of how do you support grassroots change, gra grassroots sort of radical change uh, that doesn't promote imperialism, the first thing is you have to start talking to people in the grassroots. I think as an as editor of this magazine that um, we promote uh, uh, social justice in Latin America, you know, one of the things that we absolutely try to do is make sure that we are in constant conversation and communication with actual activists and grassroots people. And if you talk to them in Venezuela, they will be the first ones to tell you the corruption is out of control, the, the state security forces are out of control, um, the National Constituent Assembly is not actually promoting a uh, communal state. Um, and the, the, uh, the CLAPS, the, sort of the, the mechanism to try to you know, ameliorate some of the food crisis by providing direct um, you know, food assistance, that that is highly susceptible to corruption. The things they tell you about the military and corruption in the military is you know, outrageous. Um, and so in the face of that, you either, you know, you, you sort of, you support and articulate and amplify those concerns, but you do so, as I said before, understanding that these do not happen in a vacuum, right? Critiques that ascend to a vision that, again, I disagree with David on this, that sees all intents, all, people's intentions either as always bad or always good, I think basically provide a space for understanding geopolitics as a neutral ter terrain, and it isn't. There are correlations of forces, and those correlations of forces, despite questions of intent, have their underlying logics that push things forward. And so, yes, critique, because that's what's actually being articulated at the grassroots radical sectors level, but do so in a way that also completely, as Veronica's mentioning, not completely right, but uh, but but un, but but disarticulates um, that from uh, from a broader agenda, which is in fact to um, to promote not not a more democratic Venezuela, but a, a Venezuela that has people that we like. <laughs>
Okay, the, um, uh, yeah, I agree. Sanctions, I think, cause suffering and death. Um, I think so do guns, and so does military invasion. And if you, and if you think it's just the same thing, then I'll, I, I suspect you have never seen the aftermath of a military intervention. The, I have, by the way. The, um, uh, so, does, so does corrupt economic policy, corrupt government that's not supported by the people. No, and so let me just give you a couple of statistics. Um, this is from a poll that this is a poll from field work that from August of 2017. So before these economic sanctions, 80 percent of Venezuelans, 80 percent of Venezuela uh, respondents had said that they had eaten less in the previous three months because they couldn't buy enough food. 60 percent said they had, at some point in the previous three months they had gone to bed hungry because they did not have enough food. 65% said they have lost weight on an on average 11 kilo. That's average, 22, 25 pounds on average. No? So, uh, and there's some people that don't lose anything. So there's some people that have lost considerably more than that. So uh, this, is, this is not radical change that is being uh, smothered by uh, uh, imperialism. This is elite co-optation and pilfering of oil resources that belong to every Venezuelan for the privilege of a few. So if you think supporting Maduro, the Maduro government right now, you're supporting popular movement, you're sadly, sadly misinformed. You're actually supporting privilege and affluence on the backs of average people. Um, I think we're gonna end with this question, which is, um, I'm gonna read, could you speak to the ways in which the oppositions this organization has led to some issues, also a sense of nostalgia for the Venezuela before Chavez that erases the history of poverty and struggle that is very present in the opposition. What does the opposition need to look like? Would be the final question. Sounds like a historical question. <laughs> I will say that um, one part of the problem is the opposition we are having. So um, there is a lack of connectivity with um, the social needs of the people. So you have a sort of discourse in terms of civil and political rights, but it's, it is not able to still build a discourse, a discourse in terms of social rights. That is the one that in the popular sectors still is very important. So there is this very important lack uh, still nowadays. That was what was the issue. Um. Yeah, I guess I'll just say quickly that, um, let's see, I completely agree with what Anagas said before, that uh, the opposition is very variegated, uh, it's very diverse in terms of its ideological positionings, it's, and where those positionings come from. No greater indication of that than what's happening over the last few days, which is that Henry Falcón, who is a very popular governor of the state of, of Lara, who used to be a Chavista, sort of uh, defected from Chavismo, became allied with the opposition, was always seen with suspicion by sectors of the opposition who just basically painted him as one, another Chavista, which comes to your point about um, you know, the othering and the problems of othering. Uh, in, a, in a wider context of polarization, there's no opportunity to be able to bring in the kinds of nuances and complexities that Victoria's work, and I think all of our work, tries to, tries to uphold. So what does that mean in terms of actual politics on the ground? Well, what it means is that the only alternative is a wholesale eradication of what currently exists, or on the flip side, a complete um, disavowal of, uh, of, of other forces within, this, within um, the nation in order to, to stay in power because what's coming is candela, right? And so, you know, it's like fire. And so what that means in terms of what the opposition discourse is, it's actually quite ossified as well as the Chavista discourse. Both of them are completely ossified, right? One is articulating a civil and political rights agenda that um, has completely alighted social and economic concerns. And we can go, I'm happy to talk about the various manifestations of that over the years. But I think especially now it's very challenging and very dangerous and the reasons that David mentioned because, as I see it, 
the center of gravity of the opposition has shifted not from as it had been before, like moderate versus radical sectors within Venezuela, but rather now it's primarily abroad in a population that is outside of Venezuela. And so the center of gravity of the opposition is now primarily with expatriates who are leading an agenda that is much and you know, more and more seeming uh, to be you know, this kind of regime change agenda. And you see this with, for instance, you know, people like Antonio Ledesma, who used to be the, the governor of Caracas and then was put into jail and then fled to exile to, to Spain, where he sort of declares himself president of, in exile of Venezuela. And you see this with, I think there was a gentleman here who said that they were you know, appointed, uh, you know, um, uh, Supreme Court Justice by the National Assembly, the Organization of American States basically created this s platform where they issue decisions in Washington, D.C. as uh, kind of uh, Supreme Court in exile. So this establishment of a government in exile should worry anyone who's actually thinking about what's good for Venezuela in the long term. Because if we're just replacing one kind of ossified regime with another that is completely disconnected from concerns on the ground, you know, you're just setting the conditions in place for, uh, for the next uh, you know, crisis uh, to come. Okay, uh, thank you to all those of you who have held out <laughs> this long. The, um, this has been a great discussion. The, uh, I, let me just say it too. I, I agree with everything that my uh, uh, colleagues just said. Let me just let me just take it up to the uh, present in the in the future. I think it's actually unfortunately gotten a little worse, in the sense that uh, the political dynamic over the past year or two, the the, the incredible debacle of Chavismo, the sort of the rather obscene slide into obs uh, authoritarianism, I think has discredited among many. Uh, all that ever happened during Chavismo. No, there, there was a time five years ago, 10 years ago or so, in which there was a recognition of the opposition that they had to think more in terms of the social welfare mm -hmm. of the broader population. They had to reach out, they had to do field work. Now, a lot of that has been completely discredited and there's very little uh, attempts, partly because they're in crisis, partly because of you know, a, a number of, uh, of, of uh, issues, but there's, there's very little of that discourse now within the opposition. Now Chavismo, I think, has been largely discredited, and I think some of the gains uh, of, of sort of pulling the opposition to become uh, uh, more engaged with the population have been lost. And I think on the other side as well, Chavismo, I think uh, there's a certain hardening. I think the the impact of sanctions, especially these financial sanctions, you know, has allowed, has given them some breathing space to say, well, it's not really any inherent problem with our model. No, it's it's this exogenous impact of of sanctions. It provides sort of a red herring that I think has allowed Chavismo to it's sort of uh, stamped out any kind of uh, internal critical discourse. Uh, you know, there's many reasons that that doesn't happen, but that's one of the reasons. So I'm a little bit, uh, I hate to end with a pessimistic note that way, but I think, I think the situation of political representation has actually gotten a little worse recently. Okay, so we still have some more questions, but we obviously running out of time because we need to leave the room at some point. So what we wanna <laughs> do is invite you all to stick around. Uh, here over some non-alcoholic drinks and food <laughs> and continue uh, talking, reaching out to our guest speakers and, and continue uh, talking about these topics in a more informal way. Thank you so much for your attendance and for your questions and engagement. And thank you so much to David, Alejandro, and Veronica for their generosity and their intelligence.